Thank you, folks. Appreciate that. Appreciate y'all a lot. If you got a Bible with you, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, if you would, please. Last Sunday evening, in light of all that has happened around us and that has bothered us and worries us and disturbs us, we tried to talk about how we should react, what we should get involved in as Christians, being biblically based, realizing and being honest, as we've said 99% of the time, my first reaction is wrong and I have to ask God to forgive me. I've got a feeling most of us in here probably fit in that category. When somebody does us wrong, our, our first reaction, usually we have to ask God to forgive us for them. But in studying the Word of God, trying to come to a proper understanding of what God would have us to do, found out that there's a, a pattern that's in the Bible. And uh, we shared, tried to share that with y'all last uh, Sunday evening. First thing is always pray. Pray about everything. The second thing is we're to, to watch literally. And we pointed that out as Jesus said to his disciples in the garden the night before he was crucified. What could you not watch and pray? And so watching is a part of it. We need to be alert. We need to be alert. And to be willing to warn But we try. 
in light of the fact that of all that's happened, we, I asked the question for us, well, then what are we to do? If you take in these four things that we used, and the little outline, those words are in the bulletin this morning. If you take that and try to apply that to your life, then what else can we do? How about this? Have you ever made one of your enemies to become a friend? Have you ever done that? Have you ever, have you ever, ever had a, I mean, a major fuss fight argument with someone and then you wind up on down the road, you wound up getting to be friends? I mean, I used to be the way it was in school around us in Middle Georgia. I don't know about down here. And, uh, you know, if you, you get, kind of get mad at one another, us guys, we'd go out back somewhere and we'd have us a little fight and, and then we'd come back in the door hugging one another. <laughs> Found out who, we, we're both willing to fight it out if we need to, but we'll, we'll love each other when it's over. We did that. I've seen that. These eyes, I've seen it. You want to make your enemies your friends? That's the goal. Oh, but now wait, how do we do that? You got a Bible with you. Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 10 and following. Y'all remember the old guy named Saul? He was persecuting the church. He was killing Christians. He was as bad as ISIS. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I believe it would be an appropriate, proper, descriptive to compare Saul to ISIS. I really think you could. Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Unto him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And there and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. When one who hates the Christians gets right, he can become a preacher and love the Christians. Let's pray. Lord, may your will be done in this room. May we bring glory, honor, and praise to you. Lord, may it be that you will be pleased with what we say and do. But God, that, it, that you might be honored. Lord, for we've learned that if we do anything that brings glory to you, it winds up being good for us. Bless us to that end. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. In these scriptures, you see the story of Saul. He was, he'd gone out, he had uh, taken people captive. He'd, he would bring them back. He'd, he'd be the one to, to make sure they got killed. Even Stephen in the book of Acts and earlier, uh, whenever Stephen, a deacon, was uh, stoned to death and killed, uh, the Bible lets us know that it was this man, this Saul, was standing there with him, but he was a kind of a leader of the bunch, you know. He was, a, he was the head of the pack, so to say, and, and all the rest of them gave him their, their jackets and their coats, and he stood there and held those jackets and coats while the other guys picked up the rocks and the stones and began to hurl them at Stephen and uh, actually wound up killing Stephen, and, and Saul was standing there holding the jackets while they were doing it. He hated Christians, hated them. Now, let me share this first of all. Please hear me. In the simple explanation of how a person gets saved, 
Five steps, and it's in the bulletin. You can read it and use it anytime you're willing to. A person's got to hear about Jesus. They've got to believe what the Bible teaches about Jesus. They've got to be willing to confess that they're sinners, and they've got to be willing to repent of their sin. You don't do that, you go to hell. I'm serious. That's it. Those four are not debatable. They're not optional. You do it or you don't make it to heaven. But now there's a fifth thing that's there, and it is the drawing of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, without the work of God's Spirit in your heart and in your life, you don't get saved. I'm sorry. So whenever that conviction is there, whenever that realization that there is a God and, and He's real and there's a heaven there's a hell and I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven. Uh, if you want all that and you got that realization inside of you, then you get right with God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit had already been working on Saul. It had already been there, the, the vision from God, the Jesus himself coming down and, and confronting Saul and letting him know the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's there, and it's got to be here still. God's got to do his work. You and I cannot save anybody. We tell the story. We let them know about the story. Jesus, who was born of the virgin, lived a sinless life, died on Calvary's cross, buried in that tomb, third day rose from the dead and came up gloriously and has now ascended to heaven and one day he's coming back and has split that eastern sky and every eye will see him, every tongue will confess he's Lord and every knee will bow before him. But now your job and my job is to tell that story. When we tell that story, then it's God's Holy Spirit that takes the truth of the story and begins to draw people to him. Here, Saul has already been convicted, and God met him actually through the Spirit, if you will, and, and that vision there on the, the road to Damascus, and God spoke to him, and Saul got under conviction. There's something, who art thou, Lord? And, and, and here uh, he sent Ananias to talk to him and tell him, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And Saul had the scales of his eyes that had been blinding him to the truth for all these years. They fell away somehow, some way. God's work. That's God's work. Now hear me. Your job and mine is to keep telling the story. Do you know Muslims can get saved? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. You know what we need to see happen? It's for them to get saved. I remember when I first got saved and I was crazy enough, I tried to witness to the street signs. I didn't care, anybody, anywhere. And I was at work and I was witnessing to a bunch of drunks, sorry rascals, mean poker playing, playboy watching, anyway. And I was trying to tell them about Jesus. Lord, they'd laugh at me, make fun of me. But I keep telling them, I keep telling them Jesus is the answer. He is, he's the answer. And I want you to understand something. In so doing, I was just telling the story. And I'll never forget one day, a guy named Richard, he, I, I was talking to him. He's a little older than me. And he looked at me and said, wait a minute, Daryl, I've read the Bible all the way through. And it says if you believe in Jesus, that makes you a Christian. I believe he lives, so leave me alone. That makes me a Christian. And he ran out. This is like about 8 o'clock in the morning. And he went outside the door and jumped into his vehicle uh, to go to a job we were working on. And, and I had to walk behind him and got into my vehicle. And I was headed over and we were driving down the road out behind him. And all of a sudden I realized, yeah, but I remember, I, I, I haven't been saved two months, and I remember that verse in James where it says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well, the demons also believe and tremble. And I couldn't wait. I was, I was staying right on Richard's bumper on his truck, and we got all the way over to Fort Valley, Pierce, uh, Peach County, and, uh, and we got on the job where we were working out there, and, and he pulled off the road, and I pulled off the road, and I jumped out, and when he opened his door to get out of his truck, I said, But Richard, let me tell you, the, the Lord says that you believe there's one God good. The demons also also believe and they're going to hell. <laughs> oh, Daryl, leave me alone. Oh, yeah. Hey, whoa, wait a minute. Your job. Are you, am I getting through? Your job is to tell the world about Jesus. God does the Holy Spirit convicting, and when God does the convicting, then they start coming. If I can talk you into it, John Doe can talk you out of it. If God's Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, wakes you up in the middle. You ever been woke up in the middle of the night by something just, why not? what's going on? And it's just eating at you? I like that. I do. But that means it ain't me, it ain't the preacher, it ain't the Sunday school teacher. It's God. He's trying to get a hold on you. Saul had been confronted by God. Ananias was just the messenger that went over there to tell him, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And when he told him the story, the scales fell away. And it became 
a follower of Christ. And John, he started preaching Jesus, but yet the folks were still scared of him. <laughs> yeah, and rightfully so, rightfully so. Well, I would say to you that our job is to reach the world. I've been, I've been thinking, you know, I don't know how to tell you this. I don't get to preach for the next three weeks. And um, I, uh, I've been working with some of our men here that's going to be filling in. And, and uh, you know, of course, half the, through December, I don't preach half the time anyway. All this stuff that's going on. And uh, so, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was aggravated by that. And I was doing my study and I was thinking, man, I can't, what am I going to I can't say that. I ain't get a chance to say that. And I, it, the thought ran through my head. Well, maybe I ought to just get up there and be like I was told years ago when I get in the pulpit, I should be like a dying man preaching to dying men. Well, you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's the way it is. Makes you think, well, what, what, can I, what should I say to leave in their mind that will be there for permanent? Well, I can talk to you about how you need to make sure you're saved. Being sure you're saved is not something you ought to play games with. Knowing that you have asked Jesus Christ to forgive you and be your Savior and that you have committed to Him your life, be sure these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen? That's what I want. I don't want to hope so, maybe so, think so, might be so. No, you want to know this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Not who you marry, not where you work, not where you live, not where you go to school. It is, are you ready to meet Jesus? That's, it. That's number one. That is number one. Are you, you a no-so salvation kind of guy? Are you sure? Are you making a commitment to him? I thought about that. Said, well, Lord, this day we're living in now, it don't look so good. We got some nutty folks in leadership, politically speaking. Some folks that I don't believe are holding to the standards that the United States of America has been held to for 200 years. They're taking us down a road that I don't like and I'm scared of. And I just be straight up with you. You may say, "Oh, it don't bother me. I'm not afraid." But you're a nut, then. Did I say that? Oh, I meant that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> If, if what's going on in the world that day, the realization there are folks in the United States of America who would kill you and kill your family for no reason at all. Man, what does it take to scare you? I ain't scared of nothing. I've heard people say that before. And then somebody throwed a rattlesnake on the floor. Yeah. Back in 1840, in a home in Virginia, a wealthy family, well-to-do kind of guy, bunch of land, even had slaves. They were Confederate, whatever. A little child was born. They named that child Charlotte Diggs. Am I saying that right? That digs or something else? Y'all see it in the bulletin? D I G G E S. Diggis? I don't know. Is it Houston or Houston? You know, whatever. Anyway, Charlotte Diggs, moon. Moon. Yeah. This little girl had a very dedicated Christian mom, had church services in her home. Invite the preachers over and all that kind of stuff. This little girl, though, really didn't care. She wasn't interested in all that. Matter of fact, she was more interested in being a, a school teacher for some reason. That's just what she wanted to be. And so if she got to be a teenager, somewhere around 13 or 14 years old, she, her family sent her off to school. Back then it wasn't right down the road. It was off to ladies' school. And she went there in a, a school with all girls, and she was learning how to be a teacher. When she was uh, 18 years old uh, in that school, they had a revival at a chapel back then. It was a, it was a Christian school. And uh, they had a chapel, and they invited John Broadus to come and preach. And he was a great Southern Baptist preacher of the last century, or two centuries ago, however long it's been. And um, he came, and he preached the Word. 
this little 18-year-old girl all of a sudden got under conviction. She's known about God all her life. But something happened. It sunk in. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, amen? It sunk in. And she realized she wanted to be a Christian. And she wanted to follow Jesus. And she made a commitment. I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to serve my Lord. And from age 18 to age 32, she taught school. She, she did a lot of teaching and uh, got involved in higher education and stuff. One of the first women to, to do that in America. And uh, she's very well educated and uh, very well to do. Uh, but it, it was one little problem. She couldn't get, she didn't get seen very much. She was only four foot three. <laughs> and, but a little lady, but she was big heart, big commitment. When she was 32 years old, something happened and she realized she wanted to be a missionary. Her sister had already a couple of years earlier made a commitment to be a missionary and gone to China. Well, this young lady gets under conviction about being a missionary and she goes to the missionary board of the Southern Baptist Convention and she talks with them and begins to deal with them and they finally agree they'll accept her as a missionary. And six months later when she is 33 years old, boom, she's on a boat headed for China. China. We call her Lottie Moon. She got over there and this little four, maybe being four foot three she fit in. <laughs> she got over there and... and uh, she went to the thing about it, she, she did her work in the city where it's named the towns that she went to and worked with the missionaries that were over there. And, and, but it wasn't in her heart. In that city, what they were having her do as a female missionary, it really wasn't a whole lot of uh, stuff except working with girls because the Chinese women didn't want anything to do with her. They didn't want anything to do with any women uh, from overseas. And, and, and she began realizing that that was not where her heart was at. And, and she had the opportunity to go out of the big city and out into the, the countryside in some of the little villages with some of the missionaries. And once she was out there, she actually finally had the chance to actually witness to some people and talk to them about Jesus. You got to tell them about Jesus, you know. And she did that and she got excited about the realization she could actually tell people about Christ of Calvary's cross. And oh, man, that, that boy grabbed her. That's where she wanted to be. And she started writing letters. She was very well-educated and a very prolific writer. And uh, as a matter of fact, as a uh, missionary in China, she would write letters back to the United States, to the Home Mission Board and the directors of this and that and other. And a lot of her letters that she wrote back here wound up being published in uh, Baptist material, uh, magazines, uh, newspapers, and all this kind of stuff. And she was very effective in her penmanship and her ability to communicate. In about 1887, she realized there was not enough missionaries in China. And they needed help. And they wasn't getting it. There wasn't much money going around. And uh, so she wrote back to some of her lady friends here in the States and the different churches and suggested that they, about the week before Christmas, they ought to, to pray about and challenge your church folks to, to give some money uh, to foreign missions of the Southern Baptist Convention. And they did. Some of the ladies back here in the States liked the idea. They took it up and they began to do that. And the first week in January in 1988, they collected $3,400 and something dollars. Woo! That was enough money to send three more missionaries to China. Do you know what I'm saying? $3,400 and something dollars and they sent three more missionaries to China. And then they got excited about it. And they started doing it every year. And it started growing. Now, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering to a lot of folks doesn't mean a thing. I've even had folks come to me before, and, and in, in, in genuine, sincere Christian brotherhood or whatever, Brother Darrell, how come you support the Lottie Moon Christmas offering so much, but you don't get behind the state missions and the home missions and the, all these other missions programs? I, you, I try to tell you, you give where God lays you on your heart. Amen? And if you, God lays on your heart something over there, over here, whatever, you do what God puts on your heart. And I mean that. I'll support you in doing that if that's where God leads you. I grew up in a church where my pastor let it be known that we stop and think and you do the math. Figure out how many churches there are in the United States, how many preachers there are in America, and then you look at the rest of the world and you do the comparison. You see how blessed we are, and I'm sorry, those of us who are living 
in poverty here in America. We are better off than half the world, period, even if we're in poverty. Something's major difference. My home church, my, my pastor used to, uh, he challenged, y'all might not believe this, he literally every year in December challenged the people at, at Second Baptist Church to give a week's salary to missions. That was his challenge. And they'd give it. Pile of money to missions. When you, oh, 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 oh. A preacher doesn't need all this money. Let me share something with you. Do you know that in, uh, about 20 years ago, I believe it was 87, uh, that the records were showing that the average Southern Baptist church sent like 8% of whatever comes into the church on to missions. Do you know that today it's getting closer to 3%? The giving is going down. And I know we can start and we can back up and say, well, and since 08, you know, I, what I had in the bank preparing for my retirement, it's gone or, or it's half of it or, you know, all these things. The economy is bad. We're not, you know, all this kind of stuff, we can say that. Bottom line is, today, according to the information that you can get online or anywhere you want to, go into Southern Baptist information, it costs a little over $51,000 a year to keep a missionary out there today. <laughs> Compared to that, to 3000 sent three missionaries back in 1888. But anyway, $51,000 to keep a missionary on the field for a year. It's the average. Some less, some more. Depending on where they were serving. But did you know? If you, if you go online and go to our Georgia Baptist Convention, you can pull up a letter from Don Hathaway. Don was uh, uh, the president of our Georgia Baptist Convention, just rotated off this, this year. And uh, Don wrote a letter and published it and sent it out to all of the churches and everybody. And, and in there he pointed out that we're calling, I think he said, between six and 800 of our missionaries home because we can't afford to pay them. Okay. Our finances are going down. I probably shouldn't even say this because here at Mount Vernon we've been so blessed and God has been so good to us as a church, and I mean that. Hallelujah, praise the Lord for Mount Vernon Baptist Church and you, the folk of the church. But in the big scheme of things, in doing the big job, can I share something with you? We want to stop ISIS. Let somebody tell them about Jesus face to face. I got news for you. The God I serve he can shut the mouth of anybody in the world. He shut them lion's mouths, didn't he? For Daniel, he did. The God I serve is able to bring conviction to anybody, anywhere, anytime, if, if somebody's out there praying and doing a work that God says we're supposed to do. If we'll go tell the story. Wasn't it MacArthur at the end of World War II? Some of you guys will know the answer to this. At the end of World War II, when we got them to get on that little ship over yonder outside of, uh, on the edge of Japan, they signed that treaty and the war was over. MacArthur's statement that I read said, Send missionaries! Send missionaries! We need to tell them there is a God and it ain't their emperor. That was his cry. Send missionaries! I'm going to be straight up with you. Today in the United States of America, what needs to happen is we who claim to be Christian, and let's hang on to something here. Let's get this fact straight. Over 90% of the folks who are members of our Southern Baptist churches will never, never, never lead one other person to faith in Christ. They don't tell the story. Why? Well, Brother Darrell, I'm just too bashful. Bruce Bowen ain't in here, is he? I was hoping Bruce would be here. I mean, I'm Bruce Bowen, Bruce Butler. I'm sorry, Bruce Bowen, I say you. Bruce Butler. I was hoping Bruce Butler would be here. I remember Bruce Butler telling me a story about him and his daddy, Mr. Benny, going right down the highway here, right where the pastor 
church used to own the pastorium right down there. Bruce told me a story about him and his daddy going down there getting ready to go fishing. And they went out there in the palmetto bushes and they got down on the ground, started to grunt earthworms up. How many of y'all ever grunted up earthworms? Oh, some, of, some of you poor souls. Yeah, amen. Today you go bite them things. <laughs> and Bruce said him and his daddy went off out there and they drove their stob down in the ground and he went to grunting on that thing, rubbing on that stob. And he was sitting there and he looked at his daddy and daddy would both squatted down and he looked him right by Mr. Vinny was a rattlesnake. And Bruce looked at his daddy, so he told me, and said, Daddy, when I say jump, don't say nothing, just jump out of the way. And he said, jump, and Mr. Benny jumped away from the rattlesnake. Can I give you a tip? Amen. Can I give you one? There's a rattlesnake named the devil, and he's out to take you to a lake of fire. And if you ain't got the guts to go around and let folks know there is a God, there is a devil, there is a lake of fire, and if you don't have the nerve to go and let folks know there's a way to miss that lake of fire, you're a pretty sorry individual. And I mean it. Those folks going to hell need to know Jesus. Jesus. Is he not the only way? There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus. Your job, if you're saved, if you're a Christian, your job is to tell the world. Jesus said, just before leaving, and you know that's when you always say that, which is important. Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me or about me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where else? The whole world. Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I'm sorry. My wife has been trying to talk me into getting on a plane. I think she's wanting the insurance money. She said, we need to take a real vacation. I said, let's go to the Sotilla River then. <laughs> you know, I don't care to get up there in the air. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not scared of it. I really ain't. I just don't have a desire to go off like that. I have no desire to fly over the big blue. Go to Hawaii. She'd been there. She loved it. <laughs> I don't want to go to Jerusalem. I'm sorry. I've talked to a lot of folks. Oh, yeah, I love Jerusalem. want to go to Jerusalem. want to see the, the, the hill. We want to see the... I said, I can see it in... The Bible, I got pictures of it. You want to see it? <laughs> In the back of my Bible, I got pictures of it. And, uh, I have no desire to go there. Now, hold on. Y'all laughing at me. But I know my Jesus has commanded me and you to make somebody, make sure somebody tells them people over the big blue about Jesus. Now, I ain't going. I have been so thankful God didn't call me to be a missionary. I am serious. But I know it's my responsibility to help make sure somebody goes and tells the story. Can I get an amen? I'm telling you all this because next Sunday morning, it's when we collect. And did you know? You know, listen to this one. I think it's like 4,500 foreign missionaries that we as a Southern Baptist Convention support. About 4,500, maybe it's 4,700, something like that. $51,000 a year to keep them there. But did you know over half the money that supports those missionaries comes in by Lottie Moon Christmas offering? Over half of it. Now, that's why my pastor supported foreign missions so we could send those missionaries and keep them there. That's why I support them. 
Next Sunday morning, you'll have a chance. And then you don't, and I'm going to be straight, please hear me. If you come in here and you feel led to give to any other organization that is Christian in the world, I guarantee you, Lamar Turner will help, help you do it. He's that kind of guy. And uh, if you want to give to whatever appropriate missions work that you feel led to give, amen. I'm, it's just, it's Lottie Moon Christmas offering that we support in Christmas time. We'll give you the chance. And I hope you pray about it. That way you can do whatever God wants you to do. That's what you need to do. And I mean that. Just that I know that you and me, we've been blessed way too much. That's the truth. Blessed way too much. Are we sharing that blessing? Are you sharing the story of Jesus? It's Christmas. I don't like happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Christmas. A Savior is born. I like what you said a while ago, Jonathan. Then many babies grow up to be kings. Then only one king became a baby. Jesus. How you stand with him, friend? I'm going to baptize some tonight. Looking forward to that. Can I be honest with you? The doctor has told me I'm going to have one of them dumb boots on for three weeks. Then after that, he's going to put my foot in a cast for about six weeks. I ain't going to get to get in the water for at least two months. So if you want to get baptized, let's do it tonight. Let's do it tonight. And uh, I hope you will. But if you've never been saved, you better do that now. Let's pray. Lord, in this room, there's all kinds of needs, and I don't, I don't know how to meet them, and I know I'm not able, but, Lord, I know you can meet every single need, and you can be a blessing in every single case. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us, Lord, to let you do in our lives what you want to do because you love us and you're God. Lord, we talk about these folks around the world that's mean and bad and evil and wicked. God, help somebody tell them about you. May they learn that you, Lord, tell us we're commanded to even love our enemies. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Lord, in this room, have your will in your way for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What you want to sing, brother?